there's something hiding deep beneath the world of Minecraft. If you spend your time in the relative safety of the surface, you may never find it. The peaceful villagers, the livestock, the wandering traders, all of these go about their daily lives, oblivious to what lies beneath their very feet. Yet, ignorance does not change the facts. There's something really strange going on deep underground. As we explore, we find a biome called the Deep Dark. It contains a squishy and shimmering material known as Skulk. But these Deep Dark biomes are more dangerous than they first appear. If an adventurer is not careful, they can summon the Warden, a beast of such power and violence that it dwarfs all other overworld foes. Yet, despite this looming danger, in the Deep Dark we find remnants of ancient cities, outposts built with the Warden in mind. Why would someone knowingly accept the risks to build these places? Why is there a mysterious structure at the center? How does Skulk work? And what, exactly, is the Warden? To answer these questions, we are going to need to take a deeper look at the deepest biome. And there's only one way to do that. Join me for a dive beneath the waves. To understand the Warden, we need to first understand the location in which the Warden can be found. Deep Dark biomes spawn somewhat rarely underground. Upon visiting them, we notice that they're covered with a strange material called Skulk, a substance found nowhere else in the game. Skulk is not just a block, it's a category of them, with several that are related but have different properties and functions. Let's take a look at each of these. The most basic Skulk block is, well, Skulk. It's by far the most common. It has dark blue shimmering dots on the surface, and the sounds tell us that this is a squishy block. Just take a listen. The audiovisual elements are immediately intriguing, but things get weird quickly when we actually break the block. Instead of Skulk dropping itself, something quite unexpected comes out of it. Experience. At first, this seems impossible. We may be tempted to think that experience is just a gameplay element designed to provide progression to the player. Yet, it turns out that there is strong evidence that experience is a physical quantity within the Minecraft world. Magic in Minecraft is strange, but it's not random. When we enchant a weapon at an enchanting table, experience stored within the player is used and converted into the enchantment. It's actually possible to go backwards too. A grindstone converts enchantment into experience. Another key property is that energy can be transferred between beings. This is seen most commonly when killing a mob. Upon its death, raw experience is dropped and can be picked up by the player. The exact same thing occurs when the player dies. The experience is released and sits on the ground until it is gathered. One way to interpret these phenomena is to consider experience as some sort of magical energy. Much like real life energy, it cannot be created or destroyed, it only changes forms. The enchanting process is one such example of a form change. However, this experience energy can also take a different form, known as soul energy. In the nether, we find a special block called Soul Sand. We can see that there appear to be several screaming souls on the texture. If the soul speed enchantment is used on boots, a player can travel faster on Soul Sand. During this process, we see an animation. It's some sort of being that writhes and turns as if it has escaped a trap. It starts brown, apparently covered in sand. As it rises, it reveals its true color, a beautiful light blue. Then it fades away. This could be an actual soul, we know that it's capable of doing physical work in the world, such as causing the player to move faster. The soul animation could therefore be interpreted as an indication that the energy contained within the souls is being used. These souls can also be burned, producing a soul fire which is much hotter than regular fire, as well as providing nutrients for nether warts to grow. I call this phenomena soul energy, and it's shown up extensively throughout the Minecraft world. Soul energy and experience are both different versions of the same basic energy, Check out this video if you want to learn more. This brings us back to Skulk. It appears as though Skulk is somehow storing this energy. The Skulk block contains it, and when they break, the energy is released. This leads logically to another question. How did the Skulk obtain this energy in the first place? We find the answer in the form of a different block, called the Skulk Catalyst. Visually, it's fairly similar to normal Skulk, but it has the addition of a strange, bony section reinforcing the edges. Skulk Catalysts are benign, that is, until a mob is killed near one. When that happens, a complicated set of events occurs in quick succession. Did you miss it? 
Let's go to the Argean Supermo camera and slow this down. When the mob is killed, the Skulk Catalyst shows a circular puddle on top, emanating from the central point. Then, several souls are released. They swirl and escape, dissipating into the air. Simultaneously, at the location where the mob died, some blue droplets appear. They move around and search for a non-Skulk block. When they find one, they pop, and generate new Skulk at that location. This catalyst action appears, at first, to be difficult to interpret. However, if we remember what we learned about soul energy and experience, a picture comes into view of what's happening. Skulk catalysts are capable of taking soul energy from dead mobs and storing it in Skulk blocks. Notice how the soul particles from the catalyst are nearly identical to those of the soul sand. But instead of escaping brown sand, they escape bluish Skulk. The bubbles that generate Skulk contain these souls as well. Right before the bubbles pop, you can just barely see the edge of the soul inside. This is the moment when it is converted into the experience, then stored in the block. In fact, if you listen very closely, you can make out the sounds of the souls being used by the catalyst. Furthermore, upon breaking a skulk block, you can barely hear what seems to be these souls screaming. This, in and of itself, is a process that we haven't really seen anywhere else in Minecraft. But simple storage is barely scratching the surface of the power of Skulk. The Catalyst has a few other capabilities as well. Upon the death of a mob, there's a 90% chance that the Skulk block is generated, thus leading to the majority of Skulk blocks being of this basic variety. However, there's a 9% chance that something else generates, a different type of block called a Skulk sensor. Skulk sensors are half-sized blocks that are visually similar to basic Skulk. They have tentacles protruding from the surface. These tentacles are specialized sensors capable of detecting a special stimulus called a vibration. There are a multitude of possible vibrations, including actions such as walking, eating, breaking a block, and opening a container. For most purposes, it's sufficient to think about if an action makes a sound. If it does, then usually a vibration is produced and can be detected by a skulk sensor. Upon detection, the skulk sensor lights up and the tentacles become more excited. However, Skulk sensors do have a weakness. Wool has the property of being able to absorb vibrations, thus preventing the sensor from activating. Sneaking also does this, removing the vibrations produced by the sensor. This is already a much more advanced use of soul energy that the Catalyst has created. But the Skulk Catalyst can do one final thing once out of every hundred times it activates. It can generate a special block called a Skulk Shrieker. The Shrieker is quite striking. On some level, the base of it appears to be made of Skulk. It's dominated by four jagged tooth-like protrusions, once again made of the same bony material seen on the catalyst. The proverbial cherry on top is the surface, where we can see two souls swirling. Clearly, this block has an exceptionally high amount of soul energy contained within it, and as a result, it's capable of doing some truly unique things. The Skulk Shrieker is sensitive to vibrations from Skulk sensors. If the player produces a vibration, such as by walking, Skulk sensors will detect this vibration and send it to the Shrieker, which has no way to detect vibrations by itself. In this way, a group of Skulk sensors can act as a sensing network for Shriekers. So, what happens when the Shrieker is activated? Well, it shrieks. The souls contained within cry out into the air with a blood-curdling screech, accompanied by some blue particles rising from its jaws. Then, something stunning. A single heartbeat sound shrouds any nearby players in darkness, a status effect that severely reduces the ability to see. The Skulk Shrieker is clearly another step up in terms of complexity, yet once again it's powered by the soul energy to the extent that we can see the souls doing the work. We're starting to see a progression. The death of mobs causes the catalyst to produce Skulk sensors and Shriekers. Sensors help alert Shriekers to nearby players, and once alerted, these Shriekers activate. But inflicting darkness is not the only purpose of the Shriekers. If a player activates a Shrieker four times in short succession, then something different happens. Something so unexpected as to be jaw-dropping. From the Skulk will emerge the most formidable beast in Minecraft, the Fabled Warden. The Warden is a powerhouse in every sense of the word. It possesses a ludicrous 250 hearts of health, equal to the Wither and the Ender Dragon combined. It is completely immune to fall damage, fire, and lava. Its defense is rivaled only by its offensive capabilities. A swing of its arms deals a whopping 22 and a half hearts of damage on hard mode, the highest non-explosion damage in the game. Oh, and it also disables shields for 5 seconds. But the problems for a monster hunter don't end there. 
The Warden has managed to weaponize vibrations, producing a ranged sonic boom attack that hits at a distance of 20 blocks. It may be a more advanced version of a Skulk Shriek, given the visual similarities. This attack deals 7.5 hearts of damage, bypassing shields, armor, and enchantments. But even that's not all. Much like the Shrieker, the Warden is also capable of producing darkness. This essentially puts the target on the same playing field as the Warden, eliminating the advantage of sight. And it is indeed an advantage, for the Warden is totally blind. It's completely unable to see any of its targets. It does, however, have a sense of smell. It also has skulk sensor tentacles, meaning that it's capable of receiving vibrations, including signals sent by skulk sensors. In other words, these sensors help guide the Warden to its targets. When there are a lot of sensors, the Warden is increasingly effective. But this shares the same disadvantages, namely the ability for wool and sneaking to suppress vibrations. Wardens are extremely aggressive. They'll target and kill just about anything that produces vibrations, be it a harmless bat, a wandering trader, or a marauding player. More than any other mob, wardens seem especially equipped to kill as much as possible in as short of a time as they can. Their arsenal of powerful ranged attacks, melee attacks, status effects, and defense is nearly undefeatable, and rivaled perhaps only by the Wither. How is the Warden so strong? We can get some insight by examining it visually. First, we notice that it contains a plethora of skulk elements. This includes the aforementioned tentacles, as well as the bony reinforcement block. But the real key is found within its chest. Much like the Skulk Shrieker, we can see that, embedded within its ribcage, there are several glowing souls. This is what powers the Warden. The Warden contains an extremely high amount of soul energy. This concept is boosted by the sounds of the Warden. Several of their noises have, in the background, the ethereal tones of souls that we've heard in other Skull components. <laughs> Furthermore, the souls pulse alongside the heartbeat of the Warden indicating that these souls are the life force powering the beast. We should not gloss over the importance of this. The Warden is the culmination of the collection of soul energy from dead beings. The Catalyst has produced increasingly advanced capabilities. First, soul energy was stored. Then, it was used to sense the world around it. Then, it was used to affect the world around it. Finally, it was used to produce a being that can kill as much as possible. A being that's approaching the level of sentience. A being that can think. But in a way, this makes perfect sense. No longer is Skulk relegated to random deaths that occur nearby. Instead, it has created a being that can actively seek out and kill nearby mobs, which would have the awfully convenient side effect of producing more Skulk. What we have stumbled across is something similar to a life cycle. Each component in this cycle is ultimately designed to perpetuate the growth of the larger system. Skulk catalysts are aptly named, as they catalyze the entire process. Yet, we appear to have one crucial missing link in our life cycle. How are Skulk Catalysts produced? It turns out that the Warden contains a Skulk Catalyst within it. We know this because it drops one if you do manage to kill it. And that right there completes the chain. The Skulk Catalyst is analogous to an egg. If you have one, you can eventually create everything else in the Skulk family, and then another egg. All the Skulk we see was, at some point, created by the death of a mob. The Warden has been so powerful and destructive that it's killed all of the mobs in the area, to the point where no mobs exist in the deep dark. There are, of course, some things we don't know, such as why the Skulk is only found in certain overworld biomes deep underground. Despite this, we've acquired a solid knowledge of how Skulk uses soul energy in order to perpetuate itself. This fundamental understanding of the nature of Skulk is critical. This leads us to our next topic. Within the deep dark biomes, we do find a lot of Skulk. But we also find something else, something not so natural. Occasionally, deep dark biomes contain one of the strangest structures in the entire game, an ancient city. Ancient cities are mysterious locations. They contain sprawling pathways lit up by candles and soul fire lanterns. These lead to several types of ruins. Some are easier to understand, such as a soaring watchtower or a fortified pillar. There's also a sauna, with a hot pool and a cold pool, and a few changing stations. There are barracks intended to house the occupants of the complex. However, other structures are far less intuitive. For example, there's a box that stores ice, with a trapdoor leading into it. It has a particularly curious feature. Upon entering the box, the specific configuration of the lever means that it's not possible to leave and close the door behind you. Someone always has to close it from the inside. Perhaps this is why there's a doorbell. 
but even that is a little strange given the vibrations it would produce. The city also contains the occasional odd little statue or monument, sometimes accompanied by candles. Yet, all of this weirdness pales in comparison to the city center. It is here that we find the ancient city's most distinct feature, a giant frame in a striking rectangular shape protruding from an elevated platform. The frame is in a vaguely warden-esque shape. Notice the similarities between the location of the hole on the warden's face. There are also a few little loops on the side that correspond to the sensor tentacles. It is constructed using a unique material called Reinforced Deep Slate. This frame is the only place in the entire game where it can be found. The city center contains more secrets. There's a hidden skulk sensor that, when activated, reveals a piston door on the lower level. Opening it leads to a secret chamber built beneath the frame. This place contains a wide variety of redstone experiments, using complicated components that do not spawn naturally elsewhere. Clearly, whoever built this place had discovered a thing or two about redstone. The influence of the warden is felt throughout the city. For example, there's a small standalone statue that appears to be in the same basic shape as the large frame. The barracks have a similar feature in the center. Other warden-centric design elements are less conceptual and more practical. The upper and lower walkways are covered in wool, meaning that they will not produce vibrations for the warden. There are also many elevated areas and towers. The warden does not climb ladders, so these places offer some relative safety compared to the ground. There are some additional features that are a little less obvious. For example, the liberal usage of candlelight has a purpose. The flames are still visible even when afflicted by the darkness effect, providing navigational assurance in case of a warden. The chests also contain night vision suspicious stew, another darkness counter. The icebox contains snowballs, which generate vibrations that distract the warden. Furthermore, we can find swift sneak books, which make the anti-vibration sneaking action faster and more useful. There are even leggings ready to be enchanted. Whatever the purpose of this city, one part of it seems obvious. It's designed specifically to manage the warden, be it by the wool, the candles, or any of the other multitude of defenses. However, there's a more subtle truth embedded within this larger one. Whoever built this city was aware of the warden and had a solid understanding of it, knowing specifically what to construct in order to protect against it. By extension, the builders of this city also had an understanding of Skulk. We can see that they use Skulk sensors within the construction of the central island. Chests also contain Skulk blocks and sensors, as well as the hose required to mine it quickly. This evidence implies that the city was built as a response to Skulk, not the other way around. But there's an obvious question which we should not ignore. Who actually built these places? Well, there are a couple things to notice. First, we see that, throughout the city, there are locations that have dark oak, torches, as well as blue, light blue, and cyan wool. It turns out that these are some of the signature building blocks of the Illagers, a group containing the Pillagers, Vindicators, and Evokers. Their building style is most easily seen in the elusive woodland mansions. The main structure is built out of dark oak wood and planks. Furthermore, there's an entire room full of blue wool, the same colors of wool that we see in the ancient cities. It therefore seems pretty likely that the Illagers were at the ancient city at one point in time. But did the Illagers actually build the city? If we look in more detail, we notice that these dark oak components do not make up the vast majority of the structure. Instead, they appear to be mostly used as repairs, rebuilding staircases, fixing bridges, reconstructing towers, and adding additional wool for protection. Most of the city is built from deep slate blocks, a material that we never see the Illagers use anywhere else, nor do they have any history of candles or soul lanterns. We can therefore conclude that the Illagers did not build the ancient cities, rather they discovered them more recently. We can see additional evidence for this if we look at the camp structures. These are inundated with the same colors of blue wool, as well as dark oak logs. There are even campfires. Illagers are known to construct small wool camps in their outposts. It's not implausible that they did the same thing in the cities. This all suggests that these were temporary locations, places for the Illagers to safely camp while they explored the ruins. It is likely that the ancient cities were instead constructed by a group called the Ancient Builders. These were an intelligent humanoid species responsible for a wide variety of the overworld structures, such as the Desert Pyramids. The Ancient Builders were powerful and prolific, sailing the seas, discovering the nether, and teleporting back and forth from the end. Yet, they underwent a mass extinction event, turning into zombies and skeletons that we see in the overworld today. We can further confirm that the Ancient Builders were the ones who constructed the cities by cross-referencing the loot table with Illager and Builder structures. Of the overlap, there are far more items found in Ancient Builder structures compared to Illager structures. It was not the Illagers who built these cities, but a more ancient society, one that is long gone. 
Yet, despite the fact that they did not build them, the Illagers were clearly here at one point. If there's one thing we know about the Illagers, it's that they're extremely curious. Their mansion is full of various experiments and oddities. If the Illagers discovered the ancient city, then they surely had many of the same questions that we have about its overall purpose. This leads us to an intriguing framework. Could we follow the thought process of the Illagers to help us discover the purpose of these cities? Perhaps we don't need to figure out everything ourselves. Let's use those that came before us to help us out. To start, we need to recognize that the Illagers did not repair indiscriminately. Dark oak wood is a scarce material deep underground, and they would have given some consideration to which repairs were sufficiently worthwhile to implement. In other words, to figure out the most important parts of the ancient city, we should examine which parts the Illagers decided were the most important. As we may have expected, this eliminates several places like the sauna and the barracks. These can be taken at face value, they do exactly as one might expect. Even the bizarre icebox is that way, it was seemingly little more than a storage location for snowballs and food. On the flip side though, repairs draw attention to some critical details about how the city is designed. Most of the walkways in the city have wool to prevent detection by the warden. In the places where the illagers repaired these walkways, they also used wool, thus ensuring that there was no change in the safety of the walls. But one path is different. There's a main walkway leading up to the city center that does not have wool anywhere. This walkway contains eight bridges that lead perpendicularly to eight pillars. Notably, some of these collapsed bridges have been repaired by the Illagers, and they too did not use wool. We can therefore conclude that the lack of wool on this particular pathway is important to the design. The central walkway leads upstairs directly to a wall surrounding the city center. The center is elevated beyond this wall, creating a several block wide moat. This moat can be entered on each side using the woolen pathways that lead directly into it. However, the Illagers have constructed a bridge from the main pathway over the moat, leading directly to the top of the central island. It's subtle, but we can just make out the remnants of a stone bridge. This apparently was a feature of the original design. There are some intriguing implications of this setup. The lack of wool in the path indicates that a warden would be able to sense if someone was walking there, thus making these paths extremely unsafe. However, we must note that the bridge itself, as reconstructed by the Illagers, is only two blocks high, thus ensuring that the Warden can never reach the central island. Things get stranger when we notice that this island has four redstone lamps with skulk sensors on top of them. These sensors are positioned in such a way that they only activate when a person is on the central area. Any motion in the moat will not be detected, thus making the gap a relatively safe place. It almost seems as though this entire section is specifically designed to attract wardens. The lack of wool, the skulk sensors, these are all design elements that would make it exceedingly easy to get a warden near the central structure. Perhaps the purpose of the redstone lamps is not to light up the area, but instead to warn others in the city watchtowers that they are in the process of dealing with a warden. These towers are additional structures that the Illagers felt were important enough to rebuild. But there's another aspect here. Remember the skulk sensor that opens the piston doors? If the warden is being summoned to the top, then that would be the perfect opportunity for someone to sneak inside the moat and enter the redstone chamber. They could do it relatively safely. The four skulk sensors with the lamps would ensure that the warden would be distracted. And with that, we find ourselves in an interesting state. There's a person on top of the central island, a person inside the redstone chamber, and a warden on the moat wall. The people in the watchtowers are aware that the warden is active because of the redstone lamps, and anyone on the wool pathways is relatively safe. So much of the city appears designed specifically in order to get into this type of configuration. But why? Why has everything we've seen led us up to this exact moment? And why have the Illagers chosen to recreate the setup? What sort of dark ritual have we stumbled across here? Let's take a step back and examine some of the details about the ancient cities. Notice how there are soul lanterns everywhere, and there are also several instances of soul fire. Both of these require soul sand, a material that must be imported from the nether, presumably at great expense. Furthermore, they appear to offer little obvious practical benefit, as they produce substantially less light than their regular counterparts, thus making their cities more difficult to navigate. Yet, for the entire city, the builders have decided that this is worth it. Let's look at something else. The city statue is constructed from a specialized material that uses bones from skulk-related blocks. This couldn't have been easy to acquire, much less build such a large structure out of it. Furthermore, skulk sensors are utilized in the city design, something that would have been hazardous to obtain. Yet, the builders decided that it was worth it. And what about the location? A single journey to a deep dark biome is a long trek as they're found near the bedrock level of the overworld. 
They're extremely dangerous, containing the Warden, a nearly unkillable beast that can only be countered with a precise attention to detail in the city design. Imagine how exceedingly difficult it was to construct the ancient city. Surely it would have come at great expense of money, time, and lives. Yet, the builders decided that this too was worth it. And this is because the Deep Dark contains something found nowhere else in the entire Minecraft universe. Skulk. Think back to when we were looking at the Warden. We discovered that Skulk can use soul energy from dead mobs to do fascinating things. It stored experience in block form, it generated redstone proximity sensors, it made shriekers which used the soul energy to cause status effects, and it spawned the Warden, an eldritch nightmare of a beast whose soul energy fueled extraordinarily potent attacks. But all of this goes back to one object, the Skulk Catalyst. In some way, every one of the possibilities of Skulk is enabled by the Catalyst. It's the common thread, the key to unlocking the power of soul energy. So what if you had one of your own? What would be possible with an artificial Skulk Catalyst? Could it absorb energy from the surroundings? Could it infuse soul energy into new places? Could it create sentient beings? Thankfully, we don't have to wonder because we've just stumbled across one. The frame in the ancient city is an artificial Skulk Catalyst. The frame and its associated word and ritual are the result of countless experiments and represent the pinnacle of understanding of the uses of Skulk. The frame itself has strong similarities to the natural catalyst. Notice, for example, that the deep slate is reinforced using material that's clearly very similar to the natural one, the same bones found in several Skulk components. The loop may be designed to be similar to the loops that appear when a natural Skulk catalyst activates. But how does it actually work? Let's compare it to normal Skulk. A natural Skulk Catalyst takes soul energy from dead mobs and uses it to produce new Skulk blocks. But soul energy exists in other places too, such as within Soul Sand. As a nether-based block, it's not something the overworld native Skulk Catalyst would ever have come across naturally, so it's logical that the normal Catalyst would not react to it. Yet, it nonetheless contains soul energy in a dense form, making it perfect for powering an artificial Catalyst. This is why the ancient builders decided to build the Catalyst above Soul Fire, it provides much of the necessary energy required to activate it. This is also why they use soul lanterns wherever possible, in order to radiate additional energy into the surrounding areas. But what about the Warden Ritual? Why did they go through the effort to get the Warden so close to the city center, despite the risk? The answer is simple, because the Warden itself contains an extremely high amount of soul energy, so much so that it can be seen in its chest. A catalyst as big as the frame would need all the soul energy it can get, and what better way to obtain it than to suck it out of a Warden, the culmination of the natural catalyst's soul energy production. With a Warden nearby and the soul fire activated, a person in the heart of the city could control the internal redstone circuitry to fire up the artificial catalyst. In this manner, the ancient builders were capable of siphoning soul energy and using it in a semi-controlled fashion. From here, our next question is quite logical. What were they doing with it? There are actually quite a few answers that seem to be at least plausible. Let's take a look at some of them. First, the loot in the ancient city is extremely enchanted, so much more than anywhere else in the entire game. As an example, the diamond toe and diamond leggings are enchanted at a level between 30 and 50. While enchanted gear is found throughout the world, nothing else in the game is enchanted this much. In fact, to this point, we still don't really know how the ancient builders enchanted anything at all. Enchanting tables never spawn naturally. The artificial skull catalyst offers us a tempting interpretation. Perhaps this is where they converted soul energy into enchantments. There's additional evidence for this. The city contains the second highest density of books anywhere in the game, beaten only by the specialized Stronghold Library loot chest. Beyond that, the Shipwreck Treasure Room is the only other ruin where they can be found. And while enchanted books are found elsewhere, they are found at the highest rate anywhere in the game in ancient cities. What about the enchanted Golden Apple? It turns out that these are nearly twice as common in ancient cities as any other loot table. If one of the purposes of the frame is to enchant books and equipment, then this sure seems to be consistent. But what about other, crazier uses for the Catalyst? Bottles of enchanting are found at a high rate here as well, one of the few other experience storage methods. If the natural Skulk Catalyst can store pure experience in Skulk, then why wouldn't the artificial one be able to do something similar? What about a more unique capability, sensing? The ancient cities contain a unique type of loot called an Echo Shard. These appear to be strongly connected to Skulk, they have the same shimmery gleam to them, and the word Echo is a very vibration-centric word. They could be a modified version of an Amethyst Shard, another item found in the city loot chests. Echo Shards can be used to craft a recovery compass, which points to where the player last died. This ability feels very in line with what we've seen Skulk do. 
The natural skull catalyst knows where mobs died at a distance, after all. Another example worth mentioning are the disc fragments that make up disc 5, which also appear to be skulk related. If you've heard the disc, then you'll know that there are some extremely interesting sounds on it. They seem to tell a story, one that may be related to what we discovered today. However, this disc is so complicated that I'll reserve detailed discussion for a future video. Let me know if you want to see that. Maybe you buy this catalyst theory, maybe you don't, but it's hard to deny that there are a lot of things found near the city that would be conveniently explained this way, and it also gives a logical reason for wanting to summon a warden. We can't forget about the illagers though. We know that they discovered the ancient cities at a later date, and presumably experimented with the artificial catalyst themselves. What did they get out of it? Well, one of the more difficult to explain capabilities of the evokers is the ability to summon vexes, floating, blue, ghost-like mobs. Many people have noticed that they share some distinct similarities to the soul energy ghosts, including their color and basic shape. Furthermore, the sounds of the vexes are very much in line with other soul sounds we've heard down here. Take, for example, the death sound. Let's compare it to the sound of the Skulk Shrieker. There might be something there. If we know that the Illagers have been down in the ancient cities, I think there's a decent chance that the Vexes are a result of their experiments. After all, natural Skulk Catalysts can create sentient mobs. Why wouldn't an artificial Skulk Catalyst be able to do something similar? And of course, there's the other blue ghost-like mob that the Illagers possess. How about the Allay? Allays were found trapped in the cells in woodland mansions, as well as the cages and pillager outposts. These Allays probably were not created at the outposts, as it's not a great place for experimentation. Could it be that the Allays were created using the artificial Skulk Catalyst in the ancient cities? Beyond the obvious visual connection, Allays have some more subtle Skulk connections as well. Allays love sound, they'll bring items to note blocks, and they'll dance to music. This is conceptually not dissimilar to the vibration sensitivity native to the Skulk family. The prevalence of amethyst throughout the chest suggests that this is at least a possibility. Perhaps one purpose of the outposts is to serve as a temporary place to store Allays after an expedition before they can be moved to the mansions. Let's do a quick recap. Natural Skulk Catalysts are found in the Deep Dark Biome. These catalysts sense when mobs die and harness their soul energy, storing it in Skulk Blocks. Occasionally, they spawn Skulk Sensors and Shriekers. These Shriekers can summon the Warden. Using the Sensors to help it, the Warden kills as many mobs as it can, thus producing more Skulk. The Warden also completes the life cycle by containing a Skulk Catalyst within it. The ancient cities are built in the Deep Dark Biome, and they're built with the Skulk and the Warden in mind. They're designed around a giant frame in the middle. This frame is a custom Skulk Catalyst that uses soul energy from soul sand. However, that by itself is not enough. To really make it work, it needs a final boost of energy nearby. This is provided by the Warden, and there's a pathway specifically designed to get a Warden close to the Catalyst. When activated, this unlocks a wide variety of magical powers using soul energy. These powers tend to correspond to things that the natural Skulk can do, such as sensing death or generating soul-powered beings. We can also see that the Illagers discovered the ancient cities at a later date. They repaired the city and performed the Catalyst ritual, perhaps discovering how to make vexes or allays. Unfortunately, for most of this stuff, we don't know for sure. All we have is the evidence in front of us, and untangling it is a complicated ordeal. But if you've been following me this whole time, you may see that some of this stuff feels like it makes sense. It matches the concepts that we see elsewhere in the world, and it aligns with the interpretation of Skulk that we discovered earlier. Now, as with every theory, it's important to examine our reasoning and be aware of areas where we may have made any sort of leap. While this theory has a lot of logical elements, there are a few jumps that we need to recognize. Perhaps the biggest one is that we never actually see the artificial catalyst in the city become activated. Despite getting a warden nearby, the catalyst, in the game itself, never actually does anything. It's completely benign. This may be enough of an issue to cause you to reject the theory. Yet, this is the nature of theorizing about the past. Unfortunately, we may never see a concrete example of it, much as we may never see a concrete example of a shipwreck or the construction of an ocean monument. We can nonetheless use clues to make an educated guess about the history and purpose of these structures. This theory also relies heavily on the interpretation of souls and experience as a special type of Minecraft energy. I've talked about this extensively in other deep dives, but if you personally reject this, then the entire theory may not make sense to you. That's important to remember. Don't take what I say as absolute truth. The primary reason for this video is to get you thinking about your own theories. What do you think happened? Does what I said make sense? Be sure to let me know in the comments. 
thank you so much for watching this video. It's the longest and most intense deep dive episode yet. However, the Warden and the Ancient Cities deserved the time, and I hope you enjoyed our journey together. I highly encourage you to come over to the RD and Discord server. This is a place where some of the best Minecraft theorizers on the internet come to discuss their theories. Do you think you've found something? If so, join us using the link in the description. I'm excited to hear from you. Before we conclude today, I want to tell you about a cause that is dear to my heart. The I'm Glad You Stayed project. Fair warning, this is a heavy subject, but it's important. I have a friend named Abby Schley who told me a story. Abby had an internet friend named Dylan. One evening, Dylan told Abby that he didn't want to be alive anymore. Abby and her mother called the non-emergency number, but realized that they didn't have enough of Dylan's personal information. They were fortunate to get Dylan's address from a mutual friend. When the emergency personnel got to Dylan's house, they found him and took him to the hospital, where he was in the ICU for four days before officially passing away. The first time Abby saw the person that she connected with the most, he was laying in a casket. It was at this moment that she knew that this should not be a universal experience, and she decided to start a nonprofit five weeks later. The I'm Glad You Stayed project strives to educate the public, especially teenagers, on real-time suicide prevention actions and resources to save the lives of those struggling with mental health. The project provides Just Keep Swimming 988 wristbands and pamphlets to anyone who wants one. They have sent out over 21,000 wristbands and 11,000 pamphlets to schools, mental health organizations, doctor's offices, and individuals in 30 states and 4 countries. If you or someone you know is struggling, you are not alone. Go to imgladyoustateproject.org to learn more information. The link is in the description. If this is a cause that resonates with you, I encourage you to make a donation as well. If you want to show support in a different way, you can get a wristband and a pamphlet at no cost to you. There is hope, and the I'm Glad You Stayed project helps share that hope with the world. This has been Retro Gaming Now. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video. Have a great day.